Join us, friends. Great Scott, spot guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, spot guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the spa guy, and it is glow trotting with Trey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey, but we know that there's a lot of people that are. So today we're going to talk about the crazy world that we live in. And uh, I've been seeing a lot of crazy news stories lately, and I thought we would just talk about a few of them. Trey, people are nuts. You know, Billy. <laughs> you could say that 10 more times it's crazy things every day that's happening in the world um and and that you're reading about and seeing unfold i mean what is going on it's, it's people, I, I, people don't have respect no more people don't care people don't yeah and it's it's true and uh and i'll give you an example of something recent um halloween was just a couple of days ago and all these people are putting out these ring camera type, you know, I, we don't have a ring at our house. We have a different brand, but you know, the doorbell camera. Yeah. So that doorbell camera, people are seeing uh, where they put like, it's, instead of opening the door and giving candy to the kids every time, they'll put a bowl out there. And the idea is the honor system, which there used to be honor in the United States in the world. Honor's out the door for sadly for a lot of folks. They don't even think about it. And the idea was, as you walk up, you get one, put it in your bag and you move on. And they were seeing kids and adults, parents, emptying the thing. Emptying, I know, that's what I'm saying. There's no respect. Parents, with no. their kids there. And they were blaming the people for putting it out there, not blaming the people that took it. Yeah. They're literally, people are going, well, they shouldn't have done that. Well, why not? We, we should be able to live in a world where people are honest where people have some kind of honor, some some kind of self-discipline, something. But that stuff is out the door for the most part. And it just, it blows my mind. I can remember as a kid, something that stuck with me as a child with my father. I remember we went to, and I think I may have told this story uh, once before, uh, but we went to Roses. I believe it was Roses in Greenville, North Carolina. I would have been about six years old. So I would have been in the first grade. And maybe it, and I may be wrong, it may have been the second or third grade, and I was seven or eight, but somewhere six to six to eight years old. And I remember we went into the Roses, and my dad bought, he loved to put together models, and I always loved to put together models, car models, and paint them. Have you ever done that? Um, once, I think once when I was younger, when I was a kid, I put together car models all the time. So much. So I've told you this story where they came out with this special glue that was supposed to be non-toxic and it smelled from my memory. It had a orange smell to it, but it was supposed to be non-toxic for kids like me, you know, for my age. But I remember being at my grandma and granddaddy's anytime I went to grandma and granddaddy's, they would always take me or she would always take us to the store and buy us a toy. And I would a lot of times get a model and we'd get some of that glue. And I can remember waking up with my eyes glued shut because I was putting the model together and I'd get it on my fingers and I'd rub my eyes at night and I wake up the next morning, my eyes were glued shut. I couldn't get them open. And uh, that happened more than once. Um, but I remember my dad being, we were at Rose's and I could still see it. He had a shirt pocket and he had a, the paintbrush in his pocket. And what he had done was gone in the store and bought some other things, stuck the paintbrush in his pocket just to hold it and left the store and didn't pay for it. Well, I remember us driving down the road and him going, oh, God, I, I forgot that I, I didn't pay for this. We turned around and went back, went in the store and he paid for it. And that always stuck with me. And so that's just it's not in my I you lead by example. And these parents that are allowing their children or even encouraging their children or letting them do stuff like that. And the problem is, is they're not blaming the thief. They're blaming the giver. Mm. <laughs> and this, that's what we were talking about. That's Wickwam. Yeah. Wickwam is exactly that, where instead of the criminal, the, the criminal blames a victim now. 
Yeah, yeah. And that's that was something that uh that we were talking about in a case um that where the the victim is being sued by the criminal. That's and that's just that blows my mind. And I and I talked to uh, a guy about that, and he said, "Man, that happens more than than you could imagine." But exactly. that is Wickwam. That's exactly what we're talking about. Um, so the the things of having some honor, having you know, a lot of it is self worth. You know, I'm better than that. I'm not going to do that to someone. I'm not going to take something from them. And the, and a, one another thing is the conviction. When if I stole something from someone or lied about someone. I would have some conviction in my heart from God mm -hmm. and I would have to answer to him for it. So I'm not going to do anything that I have to answer to him. I have to stand in front of him one day. Yeah. One day you're going to have to stand yeah. and he's going to open the book. Stuff. I don't know about, I know you do Billy, but I think of that. Yeah. It's yeah. important. Yeah. That's yeah. real. You try, you try to do, you try yeah. to do right, you know, try to do right in every situation. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So that means that every, and it also says to be absent from the body is to be present with, with the Lord. So there will be a moment when you have to stand there and give a an account for what you've done and what you've said and where you've been and, and yada, yada, yada. And uh, I can't believe I just yada, yada, yada sin, which that's another uh, thing. That's a Seinfeld thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you don't know the yada, yada, yada episode, you need to go watch it. It's pretty funny. So- yeah. I use just yada 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 sin, and the reality is is if if you uh, are a believer and you believe in Jesus and you ask Him into your heart and you repent of these sins and repent means turn away from them and never go there again, then you can ask for forgiveness and those things will be will be gone. And Bible actually says that when your sins are forgiven, they are the they are as far as the east is from the west, which is a very interesting thing. Um, have I told you about that before? Uh, -uh. okay. And so I'll tell you what I mean by the East is the West. Why didn't the Bible say North and South? Oh yeah, you have because, uh, North and South meets, oh wait, and, wait, and, East and wait, North and South meets at a certain point, right? No, Don't North and South, uh, yep. North and South never, or yeah, they meet at a certain point. You're right. Show me. So if this is a globe, so if you're in north and you're going south, you're all you're south. Now you're going north. You go back. Now north. you're going south. Now you're going north. If you're going east, you're always going east. If you're going west, you're always going west. So east and west never meet. If See. you're looking at everything from a, from the globe, from the earth being round, which flat earthers, come on now. Um, and we live in a time where I could tell you how. Let's discuss that for a moment. So you've got this thing where there's these people that are flat earthers, right? Yeah. So my first question would be, okay, the earth is flat. So? So? How does that change anything? <laughs> so if it is flat, okay, so what do we have to gain or lose by the earth being round or the earth being flat? The answer is nothing. So what's this big cover-up that the earth is flat? How is there a cover-up a cover for what? For what, what difference does it make? Who cares? Yeah. So, but what that comes to, did you ever watch that um, documentary, A Social Dilemma? I think I've mentioned it to you before. Uh, I, I haven't watched it. Uh -oh. Okay, so it has a lot to do with Wickwam. And A Social Dilemma, what that is about is that the algorithms in the social media things, and we're talking about uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, I would assume uh -oh. X. You know, I'm assuming X would have probably taken some of these things out, which is used to be called Twitter. Now it's called X. Uh, what's another one, Trey? Uh, TikTok. TikTok um, there's there's a, a ton of them. But what they do is your phone, whether you like it or not, is listening to you. That's why you can mention something. You open Facebook and suddenly an ad for what you mentioned is there. That happens to me all the time. I know it happens to you, right? Right. Okay. And I'm talking about just casually mentioning something, not in your phone. I'm not talking to somebody on my phone. I'm talking to my wife in my living room and suddenly ads for what I said pop up, Yeah. which is just bizarre. But what it is, is they're listening 
and trying to match you to the algorithms for what you're interested in. So if it listens to you and it finds out that you are, for instance, a flat earther, that you're interested in that, what it starts doing you is doing to you is feeding you only people that have that school of thought. So you start believing that everybody in your sphere, your um, uh, sphere of, uh, what would you call that? Your sphere of influence, if you yeah. will. Your little world, everybody in that little world in your sphere of influence feels the same way as you do. And suddenly you start believing that that is absolutely the way because all it is doing is reinforcing your thought. So you could, so basically we live in a wigwam world where we're in a position that you could have a thought that is absolutely 100% false, yet it feeds you all of the people that believe that it's true to the point where you believe that it's true because your sphere of influence, that the little cradle that you're wrapped in of information is only related to that lie. Yeah. And the, and the Bible, you know, talking about going back to there, it says that we will live in a time where people will consider a lie, the truth and the truth, a lie. And I always wondered how in the world would that happen? Now, I lived before there was social media. So, you know, I'm a lot older than you. So there was a time in my life where there were no computers that you could get on the Internet and, and surf and communicate and do all the things that you could do in, in an inst instant second now, in a nanosecond, you can, you can communicate with people. So I always wondered, how in the world is that even, how's that even going to be possible? Well, now we're living in that time. We're living in a wigwam world where things that are absolutely false are said to be absolutely true and things that are absolutely true are said to be absolutely false and people will fight you about it, you know, and I'll take you back to the Elvis movie. Okay. So I hate to even go back there, but that Elvis movie was tw maybe generously 20% accurate. It was 80% false. Yet there's people that got mad with both of us because we didn't just say it was the best movie we had ever seen and everything in it was factual. Right? That's correct. <laughs> Tell us about your experience with that. What have people said to you? Oh, man. Just vile stuff. Yeah. You know? How dare you say that this movie's not the best movie that you've ever seen? Right. How dare you? You know? It, it was just funny, like, you know, and I've just, you know, forgot forgot about it but but i do have a lot of screenshots where you know i would ask people so tell me what'd you learn new about elvis and they would tell me what they learned new about elvis and most of the stuff that they would say elvis never did in his life because they believed what they saw in that movie that's and right. that's the only problem i think you and i had with this film it was a film about elvis presley and it was a movie not about elvis presley mm-hmm you know, and, and, um, you they know, used his name, don't, and be his mad, don't be mad at me because I would like Elvis's true story to be told for fans, because I believe that millions and millions of new billions of new people, a billion new people would be a fan of the guy. If his real story was depicted on screen. How and his real story was good enough, but they didn't it think that enough. it was. Yeah. It was good enough. Remember what I said that Boz Larman took his real story, crumpled up in a piece of paper, and threw it behind his head. Yeah. Important enough. What was important enough was the clothes. What was important enough was the cars, even though he did get the pink Cadillac car wrong, color wrong. Yeah. Um, and you got that firsthand knowledge from the actual person that painted the car. The car. Know. Yeah, or the guy that sold the paint. Yeah. But yeah. You know I, what I'm saying? I sold the paint that was used on the car. Yeah. I got it from him. Yeah. So it's not like you're just talking. Yeah, you know? I'm not making you stuff up. Your stuff up with yeah. stuff that's, you know. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, Billy, man. <laughs> Some of the stuff that I've screenshotted that people have said is just it's mind blogging. But hey, you know, my response always to them, well, well, glad glad you enjoyed the fake movie. <laughs> yeah, glad you enjoyed the movie. Who cares? It it really um for instance, one of one of our most important platforms or or things that we'll that I feel like is important, and I know you feel like it's important too, 
is trying to get the story as accurate as possible. So yeah. we've spent all these years trying to get the story as accurate as possible. And then people will jump on a video where you get one little detail wrong and go, how dare you get that detail wrong? Right. That same person, when we said that the movie wasn't perfection and that it was wrong, how dare you say that about the movie? Come on now. So it, it has to do with this sphere of influence. What happens is these people all join together and gang up and start saying things that are not true. But people start seeing this gang, okay? Yeah. And they start going, well, if all these people believe that it's true, then it must be true, you know, based off of just the numbers. And the reality is, is that's not how it works. And so it's also affected elections. It's affected just, just walking around since. It's affected a lot of stuff. You know, there's people that believe that there's a, a Bigfoot out there. Look, guys, everybody that's walking around now has a camera in their hand. How, what would you say the percentage of people in the United States that are walking around with the camera in their hand all day long, every day? Uh, uh, 90 every plus? Yeah, yeah. 90 plus? Maybe oh, it may not be that high because of old people, yeah. but that would be the only reason. But there's people walking around with, with video cameras and cell and, uh, and still cameras in their hand every single moment of every single day. Yet, we still don't have a carcass. We don't have a picture. We don't have a real video. We have some videos where they go, uh, yeah, that, that kind of looks like yeah. it. Uh, yeah. And what's so funny is they have TV shows about searching for Bigfoot that people watch. And season then they never, and they never, season after season after season, you never see Bigfoot. There's never any conclusion. No evidence. Oh, you, do you hear that yelp? Oh, that's a female. Yep. They say stuff like that, but nobody's ever seen them. But that's what I'm talking about. Hey, there boy. are no Bigfoots. I've seen Bigfoot though. <laughs> I'm in a movie called Bigfoot Kill My Wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a movie. So you know, yeah, but it was a movie. But you see what Bigfoot, I'm saying? Bigfoot is in our film. Yeah. So. And it's a thing where where there's so much of that stuff that people have let deductive reasoning and just just common sense. Common sense, that's the word. Out the door. Common sense is gone, man. It's a superpower now. If you have common sense, you're like Superman. Yeah, because people have let all that stuff go out the door. There's just some things, guys, that you can reason out. You don't have to have someone tell you that it's true or not true. Just think about it from from a logistic standpoint, from a a standpoint of of truth. There there has to be. See, the devil wants you to not have a foundation of truth. That's the, why the devil is so against the Bible, if you will. And other people were so much against the Bible the because the it gives you a foundation of truth. There's a line of truth. Satan is the prince of lies, correct? Yeah. And the prince of darkness. Yeah. Yeah. But he's the prince of lies. Yeah. He's the author of confusion. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. So if it's confusing to you, just know that it's not from God. So it can only come from one other place. So he will never put you into something that is confusing to you. You have to understand that is that is very, very straightforward. But now we're living in a world where everything is confusion. If you think about it, they try to confuse the truth constantly. They go, oh no, you didn't, you didn't just see that. No, you no, that didn't happen. You know, and literally things that you saw, they go, no, you didn't see that. Things you didn't see, they go, oh yeah, well, this is what you saw. Yeah, You see what I'm saying? So they're always trying to change, trying to create chaos. So basically all of this is to create chaos to the, to the point where you just get where you literally, and I've had many people say this to me, and I've even said it, that it's so chaotic at this point, I honestly don't know what's true anymore. I don't know what's, what, all I could do is go back to that Bible and that biblical foundation. But as far as What's true, for instance, um, and I don't want to bring politics into it so much, but let's go to January. Was it January 6th? They always talk about where they claimed that there was a, um, what did, what do they call that? A, um, there's a word for it. Uh, come on, Billy. Uh, I can't think of the word, but anyway, they claimed that Trump incited this, mm -hmm. this thing that went on. Well, the thing is, is they people there 
unlock the doors and let people come in. Mm-hmm. So there was all these different things that went on. I honestly don't know what happened. I don't know. Well, what I, know I've learned some like uh, uh, firsthand accounts of people that was actually up there and said that they were encouraging uh, people to go into that. Into yeah, the they, they literally opened the doors and told him to come in. And, uh, he, uh, they were, they had um, some, there were guys with guns up on the roof, of the Capitol and, and stuff like that. But literally they were opening the doors and letting the crowd come in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you hear somebody that was actually standing there that went inside the place, tell you stuff like that. Yeah. You have to question like, okay, well, what's the reality of this story? And the word I was trying to think of is insurrection. Insurrection, yep. Yeah. And um, so the thing that happened recently with the uh, the pro-Palestinian people or the pro-Hamas people going in there, that was an insurrection. But are any of those people going to get arrested? No. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they arrested the people that went in there that it really wasn't an insurrection. It was a setup. When it really was one, those people will not suffer any consequences. Think about that. Uh, you know, the answer that it, it was a takeover of the Capitol, right? And yeah. it, but they they went back in and met that night, so they weren't too concerned with yeah. bombs or anything, right? Yeah, that's right. Think about that. They all they all got back together that evening after all that chaos. It was all a show. So, in order to to be able to forward a um, an agenda, if you will. And look, all the sides have an agenda. I mean, they do. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm at a point where I don't trust any of them at this point. And, but all I can do is I'm looking to the Lord for, for my future, whoever's president. It does, at this point, it doesn't even matter to me. Um, because the Bible also says that they will put people in power to punish you, but they'll also put people in power to bless you. So I think we're in a punishment phase right now. But anyway, I didn't mean to get off on that subject. Let's go into some, um, I've got some interesting, what I feel are, are some interesting news stories right. that I wanted to talk about. All right. So did you hear the story about the guy in Georgia that um, got a $1.4 million speeding ticket? Okay, wait, no, I have it. One point okay, four. so what happened with this guy? So they sent him a, um, evidently he received, it says after he received a citation for getting pulled over in September for driving 90 miles an hour in a 55, he called the court, um, he, he got a speeding ticket in the mail. Evidently they sent him something in the mail telling him when his court date was, and it had to find $1.4 million. Oh, <laughs> So he called them and it turned out that it was like, they were saying, well, that's just a placeholder. We just put that number up there. So uh, just as a placeholder, we didn't put that so that they would make sure they came to court or anything like that. It was just an accident. We used it as a placeholder. So, I mean, okay, so why didn't it say $140 or $200 or $300? It said $1.4 million. That's a real thing that happened recently. Um, that story happened, uh, actually in Georgia and it's do what? So I hope he worked that one out. Oh, he did it. Savannah, Georgia. It says, but the city officials say the figure was just a placeholder, not the actual fine. And then they go on to say that he called the court thinking the figure was a typo, but says he was told he either had to pay it or appear in court in December. <laughs> Then the Savannah officials say anyone caught driving more than 35 miles an hour above the speed limit has to appear in court where a judge will determine the actual fine. The figure Cato received reflected a a placeholder that was automatically generated by the e-citation software used by the local recorder's court, says Joshua Peacock, a spokesperson for Savannah city government. The actual fine cannot exceed 1,000 in addition to the state mandated cost. Okay. He, he said, we do not issue that placeholder as a threat to scare anyone in court, even if this person heard differently from someone in our organization. So why did you do it then? Yeah, why did you do it? He said he added that the court is currently working on adjusting the placeholder language to avoid any confusion. So see, that's Wickwam right there all day long. They're, they're doing one thing and claiming that it's something else. Mm-hmm. You know, we sent you a $1.4 million fine not to scare you but just to let you know that you had to appear in court. 
So that's just another example of, of Wickwam. So I've got this, uh, man, people are so crazy, Trey. Um, it, Keep going. Check, check this story right here out. You're going to love this. Yeah. See what this moron did. U.S. Customs officials seized giraffe feces from a woman at Minnesota airport. Okay. <laughs> I said a moron. The story says federal customs agents poo-pooed the plans of an Iowa woman who wanted to make jewelry from giraffe feces she picked up on a trip to Kenya and brought back to the U.S. in her luggage. Wow. The woman declared the small box of feces when she was selected to have her belongings inspected upon arrival at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport on September 29th, 2023, according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The woman, who was not identified, told officials she planned to use the waste to make a necklace. She had done that in the past with moose poop. It says that giraffe poop can be brought back to the U.S. with proper permits and inspections. <laughs> you know, um, what, what's funny about this is all she had to do was get it in is just go to Mexico and come across the border and she'd have been right in. No problem. Nobody would have even looked at her. Right? Just walked in. Just walked in. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's some crazy stuff, man. Who wants most poop or... Yeah. Giraffe. Or giraffe hoop necklace. I don't. Where is she selling that at? Well, I think she, she was making it for herself. So here's another story. And a lot of things happen in Florida. Have you ever have you ever heard all these stories? Well, uh, a man was uh, shot by his cousin in Florida. If you notice, a lot of these stories happen in Florida. And this is actually a, a positive story, not a negative story. But I think it's interesting. It says swans in Florida that date to Queen Elizabeth II's gift are rounded up for their annual physicals. This is in Lakeland, Florida. And it says a flock of swans that grew from a gift nearly 70 years ago from Queen Elizabeth II has been rounded up in Florida to ensure they are all healthy. On Tuesday, there were 30, there were 50 swans collected in Lakeland, which is east of Tampa. The park supervisor, Steve Williams, said the birds are a cherished part of the city. He even says that they're a city icon and we take good care of them. They round them up each fall to enable the veterinarians to conduct health exams of the city-owned swans, and they are scheduled for Wednesday morning. These swans are descended from a pair of mute swans given by the late Queen Elizabeth II in 1957. And the goal is to keep them all in good shape. So they do their annual checkups in the fall. They've been conducting checkups on them since 1980, which is pretty cool. But she gave that gift in 1957. And it's a gift that keeps on giving. And that's a very cool story. That is a really cool story. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder how, I guess they they track them. They, they keep up with... They probably have. Have you seen those little things they'll put around their feet? I bet. I bet know, they have right. their little thing on it. I saw something recently. Where was I at? There was some animal that I filmed recently that had a tracker on them. Oh, uh, I can't remember what it was. It may have been a turtle. When uh, in was it? Tell me again. Gatlinburg or? Yeah, I was in Gatlinburg. Um. You had the bear that jumped in front of you. Yeah, I got the bear. I filmed some giant mooses that were, um, or giant moose. I think moose would be the plural of, of moose, right? It wouldn't be meese. meese. It wouldn't be mooses. Might, might be mooses. But I filmed, they had these giant, and they may have even been elk. I don't know. I can't physically tell the difference between yeah. elk and moose. But these things were giant, and they were in the middle of the highway eating. Like in the in the grass between the, the the two lane going both ways, and I was able to film that. And man, they, when I'm saying those things were giant, man, they were giant. Their horns were like that. I mean, they were their heads were that wide. It was crazy how big they were. Yeah. And um, but yeah, it was during that trip that I filmed this. Um, but this animal, where who, whatever it was, I saw was out in the wild. I just can't can't think. I remember it. seeing it, but I can't pull up what it was. That's a great story, though. That's yeah. Positive. Um, so there's yeah. still there's a lot of positive going on. Yeah. 
It's yeah, just... there's positive things out there. You know, I went to um, I went to Cherokee while I was there. We were staying in Gatlinburg at, in, a, in a cabin, and uh, there's a family. We have a, a, a cabin in the family, and um, that we could stay at. And so we were in Gatlinburg staying, and I decided I was going to drive over to Cherokee, North Carolina. Now the Cherokee Indians don't say Cherokee; they say Cherokee. They call us. They call themselves Cherokee Indians. And I went over there to film different stuff, and uh, I got to go to a a place I've never been before. I've seen it a thousand times called Santa Land, and it was pretty cool. But it was really, really old school. So you go, uh, you go in, and you go through the front, and uh, you pay, of course. And then when you get into the park, um, you go to the left, and they have this house that looks like. Um, something that you would see at the North Pole that, that Santa Claus would live in. And you go in there and there's really Santa and Mrs. Claus in there. And the kids can go in and get their pictures taken. And they have a train that goes around the whole thing. I rode the train around and they have um, a small roller coaster and a Ferris wheel. And the, you remember, uh, you may not be old enough to remember this, but I bet you they had these kinds of things at Liberty Land. Um, the boats that are in the water that the kids get in and it just takes you in a circle. It's on water but you just ride in a circle or they can be motorcycles. They have two motorcycles side by side that go in a circle. Yeah. They have all those old school amusement rides in there. And I went in and, and it wasn't real crowded, but it was, I thought it was a really neat, nostalgic looking place. The train was cool. I ate there. Uh, the food was good. They have a roller coaster that had elk horns uh, on the, or actually I'm not, I shouldn't say elk horns. It would be reindeer horns. It had a reindeer on the front of it. So everything is is uh, Santa themed or, or Christmas themed, and uh, I just thought it was a neat little place. And um, I also went uh, as kids. We went to Cherokee a lot. Have you ever been? I haven't. It's an interesting little place. It's on it's on the uh, part of it's on an Indian reservation, but when you're down there, you can see the Cherokee Indians will actually have these stages or these areas where they'll put on the dress. And they'll dance for you. You know, they'll put on the all the stuff. You know, it's all over them. And they'll dance for you. And I went over there and I asked the guy. I wanted to get that as part of my video. I haven't put this video out yet, but I filmed all this. And I wanted to get him doing a, a traditional uh, Cherokee Indian dance. Well, when I pulled up, he had it all on. And before I could get my camera and get out of the truck and get over there, he had it all off. Okay. Like, oh, you got all, they got that all fast. What in the world? And I said, I would like to, you know, to film you doing it. If you would, you know, I'll gladly pay you. And uh, so he put it all back on. And then he called over a, one of the Indian, what did he call them? Elders. One of the Indian elders to hit the drum and to do the thing so he could dance. And when you watch the video, man, he is, he's, he, he's doing it all. He's giving it all he's got. <laughs> and uh, I just love that kind of stuff. And I made the videos in, um, and let uh, uh, some children look at it. And boy, they just loved it. Again, they won't see it over and over and over again. So um, I just love that kind of stuff. I love that town, Cherokee. Um, we've been there before where we would stay. And you could stay in these hotels. They're not real high-end hotels. But now they have the uh, the casino there, which is a high-end hotel. Cherokee Casino, yeah. Yeah, they have the Cherokee Casino, which is a hair. I think it's a Harris. So they have a nice hotel there, but you could stay in these little hotels that are right on the, on the river. Uh -huh. They have a river that's about, depending on the level, it's about two to three feet deep. And it's, there's these rocks in the bottom of it. They're big rocks, but you can actually walk across it. It's not so heavy a stream that it knocks you down, but there's places that is deeper and, and thinner, but, I've been out there and, and walked across, but you can go and they'll take you upstream six or seven miles wow. and put you out with an inner tube, but then you can come back downstream. Wow. So what you do is park down at the at the town and then they'll take you up the mountain and let you come back down. And I love that stuff. I've had so much fun doing that. It's And the water's crystal clear. You see people fly fishing and doing all that kind of stuff. Now, there was a rope swing. We stopped. One of the times that I remember, we stopped in that rope swing. Um, I swung out into the water, but I hit my foot on a rock and it really hurt. So I probably won't be doing that again. And uh, it was one of those things where it bruised my foot. You know, it, it really, really, really hurt. 
But have you ever been on an Indian reservation or any of those things? I think, Ben, you've been on Indian reservation out in um, in Arizona. At Sedona? Well, I know when I went to – you didn't go with me on this trip, but I went with uh, Lori and Dave, the insurance guy, and his wife. Uh, we went to – the uh, Skywalk at the Grand Canyon. Oh, that's on, a, that's on a reservation. Now you're talking about scared. That my that video is on is on YouTube. Um, I was terrified on that, and I'm scared of heights anyway. And um, and when I say I'm scared of heights, I can watch a movie. I remember watching Rush Hour Three, I think it was, with Jackie Chan and Chris um, Tucker. Chris Tucker. And do you remember when they're on the Eiffel Tower and they're sword fighting? Yeah, yeah. Trey, I'm in the movie theater and my stomach is just going, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I feel like I'm really up there. You yeah. know, it's that realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can climb a ladder and get on top of something and it doesn't bother me. But when I'm at those kinds of heights, man, it's just terrifying. And the Grand Canyon, I was recently, I went to, in Gatlinburg while I was there, I went up to, um, Anakista. it's called Anakista. Yeah. And you go up on Anakista and they have this uh, giant Anakista thing in the middle that's a, that is a, they build it as a symbol type thing, a symbolic thing. And it's kind of the centerpiece for the park. When you go up there, there's areas that are all glass. I'm still here, Billy. And, um. There's areas that are all glass that you can stand out on. Uh -huh. and it just terrifies me to do that. And they also have a swinging bridge. It's not an Anakista. It's at a competitor there. But they have the world's tallest swinging bridge, which is, they say it's 150 feet off the ground. And when you get to the center of it, it's glass. So it's only 150 feet down. But, of course, if you fall 150 feet, you still die. Yeah. Right? You know, potentially. When you're at the Grand Canyon and you're on that glass. 150 feet, yeah. You don't need to fall. <laughs> thousand feet down, four thousand. Mm -hmm. So when you're standing out there on the glass, and what it is is a horseshoe, and the idea is is you are supposed to be able to walk out on the horseshoe and walk around and come back in. Well, that day they were replacing the glass on this side. Oh, don't tell me that. So, so, so they were putting new glass in right here. Yeah. So you had to go out and then go back, and the problem is is I had to go all the way around to this side. They wouldn't let me take my camera. They won't even let you take a cell phone out there. Why not? Because they don't want you staying out there with your cell phone and taking pictures and stuff. They want you to get on out there and get on back. But you also have to wear boots or, or covers on your shoes to go out there so you don't scratch the glass. But when we got out there, I had Dave, the insurance guy, with me, and I wanted him to film me on there so I could show that I did it. So I had to go all the way around to this side to get close enough to him for him to film me and me wave and talk to the camera. And then I had to come all the way back around. And you talking about terrified, you look down, you can't see the bottom. It's 4,000 feet. And um, I mean, but it's glass. It's that thick. Yeah. And it's different. It's, I think they told me it's seven panes of glass. If I remember, it might be six, but I think it's seven and they're glued together. And that's what makes it. But over a period of time, it gets scratched up and beat up. So they'll occasionally change a section of glass. Exactly. And they have the glass. It's in my video if you go find it. They have the glass out there before they were installing it, and I was able to to see the layers of it and all that kind of stuff that they were getting ready to put in. But another thing that happened was, now think about this. You're at this main place where you buy the tickets, and from that ticket place, you could go to that. You could go to, they had several different things you could go see. So you buy a ticket to go to one place, or you can get on the bus and go to each place. So all I wanted to do was go see this, this horseshoe thing. And by the way, at some point, we're going to have to go to Snake River to the Evil Knievel uh, rocket site. We got to go. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I have to do that. We need to see how close that is to um, Sedona and all that if it's down in that area. I, it's, yeah. I think it's in Arizona, or is it more in Colorado? I don't know. We need to look into that. Um, but anyway... When we pull up on the bus, now you got to keep in mind, they put you on a bus and yeah, they start yeah. taking you out on these roads and Trey, there's no rails. There's no safety rails of any kind, literally nothing. None. 
And while you're driving, you can see the Grand Canyon beside you. And I mean, it's not like you fall off the road down the canyon, but it's not 20 feet in some places, maybe 30 feet, and there's a canyon. So if your bus driver fell asleep or passed out, you're off. You know, I was just the whole time I was on edge. So anyway, uh, we pull up to the place and get out. And I'm thinking we're going to pull up and get out and we're going to go um, and we're going to uh, walk up to the edge of this canyon. And there'll be a um, there'll be and I'm getting somewhere with this story about kind of Whitwam, but kind of what we're talking about. But there will be I thought there would be a fence there. Right. No fence. So you get off the bus and there's a little bus stop and you get off and you start walking and the Grand Canyon's to your right, and you have to walk maybe maybe three or four hundred feet to get to the building where the skywalk is. Yeah. But in that three or four hundred feet, you can walk maybe I'm gonna say a hundred feet from the path, and that's a four thousand foot drop right there. So they are I would think you put a fence up to keep people safe, right? Right. No, no fence. So I'm walking over to the edge with my camera and I capture a kid, a teenager, maybe 13, 14 years old. And you know, when you're 13, 14 years old, a lot of times your feet grow faster than your body. So you're kind of awkward. You know, you'll trip. This kid, uh, and I'll get up and demonstrate it. He's 13, 14 years old. He's walking and trips and starts doing that towards the edge. And I captured on camera. It's in the video. And I turned and looked at Lori and I said, it's time to get out of here. I am getting away from this edge. Cause what if he tripped and grabbed one of us and took us off? Yeah. You know? And uh, so this is, this is the Whitwam part of this whole thing. And uh, that, that the thing that trips me out the most is this right here. And let me do something real quick. It is coming up. Tighten up. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Friends. That means we got three minutes left. Um, but the the crazy thing about this whole thing, and this this tells you where we are as a society, as a world. They literally had a guy, and his job was to make sure that you didn't get too close to the edge. He would literally have to tell people, hey, what you're doing is unsafe. You need to, to get back off of that ledge that you're about to fall off of and fall 4,000 feet, you idiot. That guy's job was to keep people from falling. From falling off. From getting too close to the edge and falling. His job was, and he was an Indian guy, you know, the traditional long hair you would think of. And he would be like, hey, because people would literally go to the very edge of that canyon where the wind blows, it blows them off and be doing selfies. And, you know, it's like, good it's it. God. It was over. Yeah. Wow. So that's, that's where we're at today. And that's another kind of, that's a different twist on Whitwam. But what I'm saying is we're in a society where people are so dumb, they have to have someone to tell them to put a seatbelt on or to get off the edge, man. You're going to fall 4,000 feet. Are you crazy? You know, that's where we're at today. They have to put warning labels on, um, uh, what would be an example, uh, on antifreeze. Don't drink this. This will kill you. Really? I don't have to know not to drink antifreeze from you. I know not, you know what I'm saying? What? Clorox, probably. Yeah, Clorox. I'm sure all those things have warning labels. Mm -hmm. And we're in a position now where there's so many warning labels. And it's it's just the, I, I, I'm surprised that, i tell you where we've gotten. Natural selection. Okay, so, so th there's different forms of um what what do you call that um uh come on billy come on come on come on uh evolution you know some people think that 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 evolution is a real thing i think we've actually devolved because now we're in a point where the, the natural selection if if you believe in evolution then the natural selection of of the the system culling the dumb people, we've stopped culling the dumb people, and they are are uh, procreating and creating more dumb people. So now we have a bumper crop of idiots, and uh, so I think we've actually.
created so many safety systems that are saving people that would have taken themselves out of the gene pool that are in the gene pool now, <laughs> sadly. And uh, wow, what a world, man. Yeah. And, you know, people will do and say, spread lies. Yeah. And people have no problem lying to other people, lying about other people. People have no problem going to Kenya and going, you know what? That giraffe poop, I think I'm going to take some of that with me and make a necklace out of it. Like, what? Has that ever crossed your mind to do that? Has never crossed my mind. I didn't and if know somebody that. suggested it while I was in Kenya, I would have left them there. I would look at them like, you're playing with me, right? Yeah, yeah. you're kidding, right? You're kidding, right? Now, if you're not kidding, you're going to have to stay because exactly. I'm not taking you back. So anyway, what a wild, wild world we live in. And friends, I know that there was no general theme here, but I think we got to talk about a lot of different stuff and a lot of different uh, uh, subjects. So yeah. I hope y'all enjoy that. Sometimes Trey and I just like to get on there and just talk about stuff mm -hmm. and talk about different ideas and different themes and places and things that we've done and things we've seen and things that other crazy people have done and, and that they have seen. So we appreciate you watching. Tighten up every chance you get. Go double dribble. And if you do double dribble, you might just foul out. And you don't want to do that. Not fall off the side of that 4,000 <laughs> foot drop off. <laughs> I sure hope not. Wow, people are so crazy. We'll see y'all.